morning. We're doing good. Good. All right. Um, so this is week three of kind of trying to set uh, our week, our year right uh, for um, 2019. And first week uh, of 2019, we said, "Hey, all people matter to God." Hopefully you felt challenged. I definitely felt challenged, as I said last week, um, or a couple weeks ago, actually. I had a couple people come up to me after I was saying all people matter to God, saying, hey, no one talked to me. Uh, People were here for the very first time, and no one talked to them. And and I shared that last week, but then I got a couple other emails uh, from people that saying, hey, I just want you to know that... um, we, we are newer, and we had three or four different families talk to us. And so I want to say thank you for that. For those of you that decided to kind of get out of your comfort zone and talk to people that you didn't know, it actually made a difference. And I received a couple emails um, kind of affirming that. And then last week, we talked specifically about um, what does it mean to live a life of anxiety? And does, do the scriptures have hope? in the midst of being a, a, a nervous um, human. And hopefully you received some truth from that. Um, and I think I, w- I actually want to take kind of more of a specific view that we did last, uh, last week, and I want to kind of go up to a 30,000-foot view, generally speaking, um, and ask you this. Do you feel like God has a voice in your life? I mean, just very, very practically, does God speak to you? Because that can be one of the most frustrating things about being a Christian. If you feel like God does not talk to you, if, if your theology says, I need to have an experience on Sunday morning, so Frank better bring it. Paulie better bring it. You better feel something on Sunday morning. Because if you're tied to that or addicted to that, um, we're in trouble. <laughs> you know? Like, we're in deep trouble if that's your theology, if that's what you believe. Because our number one value as a church here in West Chase, Tampa, Florida, is that we fall in love with the story of Scripture. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God speaks. Is God speaking to you? And if he's not, I bet you you're frustrated this morning. I bet you're coming in here thinking, oh gosh, what's the point? It's 11-12, right? 11-12, please, let there be something relevant for my life and if your theology is, well, I hope Frank better bring something good, then I feel the pressure. And I better perform for you. And if that's the case, man, I'm going to let you down. (laughs) It's supposed to be funny. (laughs) I will let you down. I will. I'm just going to just be honest with you. I will let you down. (laughs) Because I ain't going to come through. Because I blow it all the time. Ask my wife. (laughs) Does God have a voice? So we're a Protestant church. We're not a Catholic church. We're a Protestant church. What does that mean? Think of the term Protestant. Protest, right? Right? We're a protesting church. What, What is the baseline vitals of a protesting church or a Protestant church? It's this, sola scriptura, scripture alone. Scripture alone speaks. Do you believe that scripture has authority in your life? Because if you don't, I'm struggling. I'm gonna, uh, this is going to be tough for you. If you do, I want to reiterate that. I want to I wanna, um, renew that in you. Because we have to believe... Um, that the scriptures are powerful. Because many of us, we have questions. Do people who even claim to follow the authority of scripture 
pick and choose whatever they want to observe, Frank. Right? Frank, can an intelligent, educated, 21st century person who believes in science and critical thinking and is opposed to ancient practices like slavery read the Bible literally and seriously, believing it has the authority to determine our beliefs and behavior today? The Bible says all authority claims... Um, all authority belongs to God. The Bible never claims to have all authority. Some of you think that. No, it doesn't. Here's what Jesus says. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's what Jesus says. So when we talk about the authority of the Bible, please know that when we're talking about that, and that's the number one value that we have as a church, please know that it's shorthand for talking about the authority of God. Do you believe that? Jesus says that the Bible is my authority. So when we say that the Bible has authority, here's what we mean. We mean God uses the Bible to express His authority and His truth. That's what we believe. And that's what we believe 33626 needs. 33556 needs. 33635 needs. 33624 needs and 33618 needs and whatever zip code around here needs. Because remember, the authority initially of the Old Testament was recognized by what? By Israel and by Jesus. Remember Jesus says this about the Old Testament. Please, church, don't think that I've come to abolish the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first, the Torah, and or, or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And then what? Then we have books of the New Testament. Please, some of you believe that there's this myth that you know the New Testament books um, were chosen by Constantine. The books would become the New Testament were already, uh, were, were already regularly circulating through the Roman Empire. And you know what? If you were a Christian, you recognized them to have authority. The early church knew that this could be traced all the way back to, the, to, to Jesus' disciples and that they were consistent with the known teachings and the life of Jesus. Listen to what Origen said. The four Gospels, and that's all. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the undisputed ones in the whole of the church of God throughout the, word, uh, throughout the world. William Barclay says this, It is simple truth to say that the New Testament books became what? Canonical. Canonical in the canon, in, in, the, in the word of God, because no one could stop them from doing so. And lastly, I'll say this, 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, All Scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And the Word of God is what? It's the breath of God. That's what we believe. Here at West Town, if you come here, the only thing, I'm not saying stuff, right? The only thing I have to say is when we put the Word of God up here, that's what we believe is authoritative. That's what we believe is the truth, right? Is the way, the truth, and the life. And so when you understand the Bible, do you believe um, in the story of Scripture? Because some of you might come this morning, and I get it. You believe that the Bible is a bunch of commands. Oh, you're here at church, right? It's 1118. Um, I'm going to go through a few commands. No. That's not what the Bible is. Please don't know that. Please don't think that. Some of you think, well, it's, it's a bunch of dogma. It's a bunch of doctrine. No. The Bible is not a bunch of dogma. It, a bunch of dogma. Uh, it's not that. The Bible is not a, bu uh, a bunch of doctrines. Some of you believe, well, okay, well, at least you could say the Bible is kind of like an owner's manual. No. The Bible is not an owner's manual like you'd get if you buy a, 
you know, like I bought a, a weed whacker from Ace the other day, right? And I, and I got a manual, like, like that's the manual, right? So if I want to work it well, I got to make sure I buy the right gas and buy the right gas mix, which is frustrating, right? And then I got to make sure it, it works. And then I, um, I got to know which extension to put on. No, it is not a manual. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible is the story, the truest story of the world, right? It's a story, and it has a narrative, and it has an arc, you know? So if you read a good story, like the Star Wars, right? You got Luke Skywalker, and you've got Leah Skywalker. I don't know if that's her last name or not, but Luke and Leia, right? You got Luke and Leia, right? And you got the evil one. You got Darth Vader. And then next thing you know, you got Obi-Wan, and, and boom, Star Wars, and they kind of have their first you know, lightsaber fight. And, and then, you know, you kind of go through Empire Strikes Back, and it seems like evil's going to win. And all of a sudden, you have the Return of the Jedi. Thank God. And you have the Ewoks. I love the Ewoks. We named our two little Shih Tzus, Wicket and something else, with, with, to the two, two, you know, Ewoks, right? But the point was, Harrison Ford and Carrie Fisher were going to get together, and that was great. And Luke Skywalker was going to win. And the good defeats evil. It was the story. And so when William Barclay says stuff like, it's the simple truth to say that the New Testament becomes canonical because no one could stop them from doing so, I believe it means this, is that you would believe that stories carry authority. Right? My great uncle was on a ship during World War II. And there was this Japanese pilot in a plane that said, you know what, I hate that vessel. And so here's what I'm going to do. I am going to fly right into that um, massive aircraft carrier. And he did, right? And my great uncle died. And before that kamikaze pilot flew into uh, that aircraft carrier, he had a bunch of what? He had a bunch of commands to follow. He was just a sailor. He was just a midshipman, right? I said, I need to do this, and I need to do that, and I need to do this, and I need to do that. And I need to know what the right strategy is, and I, know who is, I need to know who is on what and what I need to do. But when you think of the story of World War II in the, from the eyes of Winston Churchill, right? Winston Churchill, the prime minister of England, who said this, as he's telling the story to his Englishmen and women. He says this, Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. If we can stand, all Europe may be free, and the life of the world may move forward into broad, sunlit uplands. But if we fail, then the whole world and all that we have known and cared for will sink into the abyss of a new dark age. Let us, therefore, so bear ourselves that if the British Empire lasts a thousand years, men still will say this was their finest hour. And that's what he said to his Englishmen. And you know what? People decided, for that story, Englishmen said, I will give my life. And they gave their life to that story. Right? You can think of Christianity as a bunch of commands and a bunch of beliefs and a bunch of regulations, but I tell you what, it's really about your understanding of, the, of Christianity as a story that will form your life, and that's what we believe at West Town. Is it the formative story of your life, or smaller story, is Christianity the Ten Commandments? I hope not. Please tell me it's not that. Please tell me it's not a bunch of regulations. Because that will fall and that will ring thin in your heart. Postmodernism, the story of the kind of after the modern story says this. You know what? When I look at the world, there is no great story. My life, it's all random. You are all aimless 
and arbitrary with no meaning or purpose. A bunch of lottery numbers accidentally chosen to live. That's what the world and culture and postmodernity says about life. It's random. You know? There's no connected story. And, and what we need to remember as a church is we do have a connected story. And the world needs to know it because, you know what, they say and they live out this quote that there is no great story. It's all random, right? Whatever you decide to do, it is just random. But the Bible says, no, we will not believe that. That my story, my, my marriage, my four kids are a part of what? A bigger story the biblical story and if I miss this if I mess this up I miss it and I will not live a full a full orbed life that God wants me to so I ask you again like I asked you 10 minutes ago do you find yourself in the story of scripture and that's just what I want to review because that's all we're going to talk about this morning do you find yourself in the story of redemption in the story do you know it and do you love it? And do you realize that you've been uh, welcomed into the story of redemption and God didn't have to ask you into it? But that you're in here right now and that the Bible is reading you and you're not reading the Bible? Because we believe that the Bible is living and active. And as much as you think you're reading the Bible, here's what we think. The Bible reads you. The Bible's God's word and it's his, life, and, and it's his movement inside of you. And as much as you think you're in control of your life, here's what we believe. You're not. God is in control of your life. As much as you think that you can uh, disbelieve and you can run away from God, here's what we be believe. That there is no way. You cannot run fast enough. You cannot outrun God. If God wants you, He will track you down and He will find you and He will save you. That's what we believe here. And so, my question to you initially is this. Do you find yourself in the story of Scripture? Because, as N.T. Wright says, it's this beautiful five-act play. Some of you don't see it that way. And I want to just say this morning, let's just enjoy it. Let's enjoy the Bible as a five-act play. A play where you realize, okay, yeah, all these different dramas are going on. And I can find myself here and there. And he's chosen me here. And in college I hear and I was in the it was in the dark part of my college area or my high school area. And you know what he called me into light. And I thought he was going to be done with me, but here I am. Eleven twenty six, January the twentieth, right, two thousand nineteen, and he still wants me. And I can't believe it. And you can't believe what I've done to um, deny him, to make fun of him. And here's what God says, you cannot out -send me. My love will always be greater than what? Than your sin. First act, the scripture tells us, is what? Is creation. It's this. The glory of God is the reason that you are moved by the beauty of this world. Please go to Clearwater Beach today. And at about 6 o'clock, for the next half hour, from 6 to 7, watch that, watch that sun drop into the horizon. And tell me you don't feel small. Please, tell me you don't feel like, oh my word, there is somebody in control of this whole thing. The creation of the world. Here's what Psalm 95 says. Let's go to the next slide. In his hand are the depths of the earth. And the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. If you've ever been to, you know, Aspen or Vail or Snowmass or whatever, Snowshoe, Shoot, um, you will see the mountains of God and you just go down it. And you will see how great and how small you are. And he says that the creation speaks to the beauty and the glory of God. Go to Zion National Park. Please go to the Grand Canyon. You cannot help but sing with the Psalms of the Bible and say, you know what? 
God is so much greater than I am, and he's so beautiful and so magnificent. I feel small. He is the creator, and I am the creature. And that's exactly what's supposed to happen, is that he gave creation to us as a gift. And he walked with Adam, and he walked with Eve, and everything was great. And then, unfortunately, we know that in Genesis 2, or Genesis 3, all the way through, really, um, until Jesus comes, really until he starts Israel, 3 through 11, we see this. Act 2 starts. And the question is, is how is God going to deal with his, with, with his grief and our sin? And what this does is it invites you into saying, yeah, you know what? I betrayed God. Kind of like Cain and Abel fought as two brothers. I fight with my brother. Big time. I fight with my spouse. Big time. There's enmity between myself and whoever it is. You fill in the blank. Please tell me that there's hope for this. Please explain to me how messed up my marriage is right now. Please tell me. Um, I thought the institution of the family was supposed to bring unity and peace. It's not what I experience. And that's the hard part of Act 2 of this story. Because it speaks to real life. It speaks to you, and it's supposed to say, okay, God, it's true. Genesis 6, 5. Let's go to the next, next slide. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of, of the human heart was only evil all the time. Think about you at your worst moment. This is what Act 2 speaks to. When you are thinking just for you, you're at your worst. You're just thinking for self. You know that spot you're in when you're at home and the only thing you care about is you getting what you want, what I want. When I decide, nope, nope, it's my time. You become maniacal, right? You become an egomaniac. You become your worst self. The scripture says, that's right, that's act two. That's the fall. That shows you and me that I need a redeemer and you need a redeemer. For you to deny that Act 2 happened is for you to say, ah, you know what, I kind of need some help, but not real help. No, that's not right. Everybody in this room, right, needs a Savior. Everybody in this, in this room, everybody needs a redeemer. And there's no one that needs it more or less. We all need it the same. And so if you think you're better than anybody in this room or you're worse than anybody in this room, the scripture says you're wrong. The fall of man came. We all need a savior the same. That's hard for some of us. Some of you think you're terrible and you're worse than a lot of people in this room. And some of you think you're better than a lot of people in this room. And you're not. I am not. So what if we had a healthy view of Act 2 and the fall of man was boom? It was pervasive in this room, I think. You know what? We could talk to anybody in this room. Anybody you don't know, you know you're not better than. So you know what? You can have a conversation. So when I say, you know, a couple weeks ago when I said, you know what? Three people came to me and came to West Town and they said, no one talked to them. You know what you believe? If you believe in in the story of Act 2, you are no better and no worse than those three people. And no one talked to them. They're first-timers at West Town. No one said a word to them. And they came up to me because I preached on that. And they said, Frank, we think you need to preach on this. (laughs) Right? Because no one talked to us. And I think people are getting comfortable. And I bet you you didn't build a church on... People walking in and feeling lonely and no one talking to them. What if you believe that you are the same as everybody in this room? You know what? Um, I think we have a starting point for redemption. That this world cannot be fixed by education. This world cannot be fixed by technology. I mean, shoot. 
How many people thought 1994, we've got the internet, we're going to be all connected, we have all this access to information and whatever, the world's going to be a better place. Here we are, 2019. Is it better than when we started in 1994? Whoops, I want to do that. 1995? No, it's not. We know it's not. So how's God going to deal with this? So what do we know? Act 3 happens. How is God going to deal with his grief and his sin through, and we know, through the nation of Israel? And so here's what he says. I'm going to change Abraham or Abram's name to Abraham. And through his line, I'm going to change the world. And I want you to do, and I want you to live by a certain a set of laws. Now, this can be confusing, and I just want to quickly say, if you were to look at the Old Testament laws, you could kind of... Um, categorize them in three ways. The civil laws, the ceremonial laws, and the moral laws. Now, let's go ahead and start with the second group, the ceremonial laws. The ceremonial laws were all the sacrificial laws in the Old Testament that pointed to the need for mankind to um, basically sacrifice themselves uh, for God. And here's what he said. Um, I'm going to send you a, a perfect sacrifice. I'm going to send you a perfect lamb. And we know that the, all of the Old Testament points to the perfect lamb. So when we get to the New Testament, and John the Baptist points to Jesus and says, there's the lamb of, the God, lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. We know that all those ceremonial laws that talked about killing animals um, to uh, satisfy the wrath of God all pointed towards Jesus. So all those ceremonial laws do not need to be carried out once the New Testament comes along. But then at the very same time, we have the civil law and we have the ceremonial law. And the civil law might look like this. This is Deuteronomy. This is the second giving of the law. This is Moses' last book. It says something like this. And this might seem completely irrelevant to you, but I promise you it's not. When you beat... The olive trees from your tree, beat the olives from your trees, do not go over the branches a second time. Leave what remains for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. If you don't have a father, and if you don't have a spouse, a husband, you know what? You are kind of second class. So, Israel. When you have this land that God's given you and you beat your olive tree, the olives will fall down and you're going to gather them. Don't beat it a second time. Why? There are poor people that need your help. Don't beat it a second time. Leave what? Leave what remains for the foreigner. Foreigner means someone who is, have you ever heard the term xenophobia? Right? Xenophobia? What is xenophobia? It's the fear of a stranger. Here's what Jesus says will reverse this in the New Testament is hospitality. If you break down the word hospitality in the Greek in the New Testament, it means this. The Philadelphia, the brotherly love of the xenos, of the stranger. You will, because of the gospel, brotherly love, though that's not carried out in Philadelphia a whole lot these days, right? <laughs> right? You will love the stranger. And you will love the stranger so much that you will not beat your tree twice. Why? Because you know that they're poor. And you know what you need to do? You need to give to the poor. And you need to do that in the Old Testament. There's this principle that we are called to give away our prosperity to the poor. Leave what remains for the foreigner, those that come, the fatherless and the widow, those that have lost their husband. Because you know what? They're not going to be able to make what they could have if they had a husband. And so God says, okay, act one is creation. Act two is the fall. Act three, I'm going to redeem, redeem the world through Israel. Not perfectly, but Israel. And that's the rest of the Old Testament. And I'm going to use Israel... And, and, and the law to what? To point people 
to the grace and the love of Jesus. And that is how we're supposed to see the Old Testament. Old Testament laws are what? They're not ultimately concerned with what many of us think, like you need to have this perfect, clean, and upright heart. No. You're called to have a giving, loving heart. That's what I want Israel to be. So when people come from Mesopotamia or from Israel and they kind of walk this crossroads, you're not going to beat your tree a second time. You are going to be a giving, loving person. That's what it means to love Yahweh. That's what it means to be Israel. Are you that? When you beat the olive tree from your tree, the olives from your tree, do not go over the branches a second time. And so we're called to understand God's word that way. And I realize some people still ask, right? You still ask this. Well, if the Bible's God's word, particularly on this weekend, right? Why does it allow practices like slavery? Martin Luther King weekend. Why does it allow uh, uh, practices like polygamy? Because we know that in America, 160, 170 years ago, uh, people used the Bible to defend slavery. We know that. Uh, people used the Bible to, fit, to defend all kinds of... Um, of terrible practices, but it's, it's important for you to understand this morning that the Bible, right, the, the nature of the Bible and the way in which it was written, because some of you, you know, maybe, maybe think of it in terms of, or, or like this, um, the Bible is different from the Book of Mormon, right, the Mormon church. The Book of Mormon, we are told, was given to Joseph Smith in one piece from heaven, that's what we're told. It simply descended on earth. But the Bible is not like that. You need to understand this. That, that the Bible is not a timeless set of principles. It's not a generic, cultureless, timeless blueprint for some kind of social utopia. Some of us think that. So if you were to read Leviticus with your family, no. You can't read it like that. It's not timeless. It was written for what? A particular people during a particular time in a particular culture. And God is going to use that to move what? To move people one step forward. And that is the third act of Israel. And that's why it's hard sometimes when you read the prophets or you read um, the historical narratives of Joshua and Judges and Ruth. It's hard to make those jumps. But if you become a student of the Bible, you will understand, right, um, that the moral baseline of humanity after the fall, um, the Bible was written during a barbaric age, and the killing of infants was a common practice, and that's the world in which the Bible was written. Wait, women were generally treated as possessions. That's the world in which the Bible was written. Masters could kill slaves without any accountability. And religion was mostly superstition because people did not know God, right? Religion sometimes involved temple prostitution right? and, and, and human sacrifices. So God began to say through Israel, no, no, we're not going to do this anymore. We're going to change culture but it was incremental. And so you have to be a student of the time and make a, appropriate adjustments. Because when you look at the Old Testament, here's what we know. It constantly limited and undermined slavery. If you watch it. The law limited the power of a master that he had over a slave. It says, it says that slavery cannot be perpetual. In fact, after seven years, a master must free his slave. In fact, it's climaxed with Paul in the New Testament where it says this, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, for all, for you, church, are all one in Jesus Christ. The whole point, the whole progression, the whole um, trajectory of the Old Testament moved towards this. Do we have these great anti-slavery movements that were led by who? The, 
the Quakers. The Quakers were the ones. Who, who else? The Methodists were the ones that said, you know what? This isn't right. And you have guys like John Wesley and William Wilberforce who said, nope, I'm not going to do this anymore. We're not going to justify these sinful cultural trends. And so the Old Testament um, calls for freedom. At the very same time, here's the tension that you probably feel and I feel, is that our culture has become what? We've become much more sexually permissive over the past 100 years. You think about what was acceptable 100 years ago and you think about what's acceptable now sexually. Are you kidding me? And so when it comes to studying the Bible, what do you do? And the Old Testament was actually more restrictive in that setting than the ancient Mesopotamian culture. It says that what? Sexual intimacy is to be reserved for what? Marriage. A man for a woman. That sexuality is maintained for that. That intensity of sexuality is reserved for the intimacy of a man and a woman. That's how hallowed that is. That's how sacred that is. Our culture right now sees that as ridiculously regressive, oppressive. Our world says that right now. And so, as you think about the Bible, the Bible says, okay, Jesus, please change the world. And we come to Acts 4, or to Act number 4, Jesus and his ministry. How is God going to deal with his grief and our sin again? Right? And just as he called 12 tribes of Israel, who did Jesus call? The 12 disciples. And he says, just as the 12 tribes lived around the tabernacle, your 12 disciples are going to live around me. And you know what? It's going to seem funny, but I'm going to change the world. And you're going to do things not with a sword and a shield, but with a basin and a towel. And here's what you're going to do. You're going to change the world by serving others, by washing somebody's feet in a, in a world where everyone walks everywhere, where everyone wears sandals. You're going to take a towel and a basin and you're going to wash their feet, and it's going to smell terrible. But you're going to clean their feet, and you're going to be so humble that they won't know what to do with it. Because you're so free, because you're so loved by me. Okay? And all the messianic predictions of the Old Testament will come true. And so you have Jesus saying things like this. Beginning with Moses, so Jesus, after he resurrected, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and all the prophets, he said, look, all the scriptures concerning, uh, I'm going to explain all of them concerning me. The whole point of the scriptures was me. It's going to sound weird. And you thought it was Russell Crowe in The Gladiator, right? <laughs> you thought it was going to look like that, like just some big stud, and it's going to look like a Jewish carpenter? Yeah, that's Act 4. That's all Jesus. That's all the Gospels. And we believe that's formative for you and for me. So what does it look like for you to be humble? For you to serve someone in your English class, students, in your history class. For you to serve the person that talks way too much in your office. <laughs> and you can't stand. But Jesus says, hey, no, no, no. Pull out a towel and a basin and you wash their feet. You tell them that they are loved that they actually matter. And that's what Jesus showed us, that all of this was um, planned by him. And then finally, we come to the last act, and that's us. How is God going to deal with his grief and our sin through the church? And it leaves us with a challenge. Right? What does it look like? Because in 1945, in April, the German army, what do we know they did? They surrendered. But the war continued, and Japan still fought. And even though, even though Germany had surrendered, we know that. And at that point, Allied soldiers who had been fighting against Germany, what did they do? This is weird. They began to what? Rebuild Germany. What? Yes. 
our allied forces actually begin to rebuild Germany. And it, the only way you can understand that is to know the story of World War II and why that makes uh, some kind of sense. That though we attacked them before that, now we are helping them. And so as you think about the Bible, and you think that some things seem weird, some things seem strange, he says to the church, he says to me and to you, please go into the world because here's what we have. We, have a, we don't have enough workers. We have a bunch of people who need this truth, but we don't have enough willing workers. The fields are white unto harvest, but the laborers, they ain't, they ain't enough. We don't have enough. And that's our challenge. That's why we have to believe um, that God has called us personally, not generally, not generally a part of You have to believe personally God has called you to share the love of Christ with others and that you don't need a priest to talk to God. That God right, talks to you through the Bible. So here's what we know the Reformation did. This is the beauty of the Reformation in the 1500s. That the Bible was translated from Greek and Hebrew into Latin. And that was the Latin Mass. And then the Latin Mass in the 1500s was finally translated into German, into French, into Spanish, and into English. Because here's what people thought. I can't talk to God without a priest or a pastor. Here's the beauty of the Reformation. You don't need me, and you don't need a priest to talk to God. You just talk to Him, right? You just pray to Him in English, right? Through the Bible, and God hears you. The priesthood of all believers was one of the major tenets of the Reformation. You believe that, right? You talk to God every single day, and you know what you believe? He talks back to you, and He tells you, that's right. I am telling you to talk to your next-door neighbor. As awkward as it seems, I am saying, yeah, that's right. The guy on your baseball team, that guy in this club, that guy in that class, that guy in that office, yeah, I am asking you, please tell him about my love. You don't need some priest. You don't need some pastor, Frank, to, to, to talk to him for you. You are the priest because you have Je or Jesus is the priest and you have Jesus. So you talk to him. It's one of the most beautiful things about the Reformation. And the Bible tells us the truth. So the question is, can the Bible speak to you with authority, with power, with influence? It's the only thing we have to say here at West Town, what the Bible says. Because we believe that the Bible is the Word of God. And when it speaks to us, you don't need a priest or a mediator. Because you and I have Jesus. Amen? That's huge. That's huge. The world didn't think that. And we've been raised in an enlightened society where most of us can read and write. But shoot, read read a history of the world where many people could not read or write and they thought they needed a priest or a pastor to speak to God for them. No. You can talk to the God of the universe in and of yourself individually and he will speak to you. And as you read the Bible, the Bible speaks to you. The Bible reads you. Do you love the story of scripture? Can you find yourself in the story of Scripture? To the extent that you can do that, you know what? I believe you will live life with the power of God. To the extent that you don't, I think you will live a smaller story. What's the point? Please fall in love with the Bible. Read it. Know it. Fall in love with it. So when people are in crisis, you will read to them, Psalm 23, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you know what, pal? You will fear no evil, for I am with you. And you can tell them that. Amen? And know that one day, here's what we believe, that the lion will lay down with the lamb, that there will be a cobra and a two-year-old, and no one will fear anything, that literally you will not be able to cry. 
You cannot cry when Jesus and heaven and earth come together. Amen? That is what we believe, and that's what this world needs to hear. But you have to be passionate about it. And you have to believe that the, that the, that the starting point for what we believe is the Word of God. And, and the power and the authority rests with that. And what Jesus has given us. To the extent that we do that, I believe we will be an effective church. So let's pray and ask God to help.